Glad to see you all here. It's Monday, the 2nd of May, 10 p.m., day 68. We're doing a new stream with Alexey Aristovich. Glad to see you. Likewise. So, as usual, we have about 120,000 people watching us live. Please do not forget to share the links after yesterday sparkling half a million. Uh, not sure if we'll repeat that achievement, but at least help the audience to gather at that time here. Subscribe to Fagin Live, to uh, Alexei's channel, and if you're watching that in English, to the Privateer Station. Also, please leave your like. That helps YouTube algorithms to promote the video. All right, Alexei. What happened on Monday? You think we can repeat? I mean, the 500,000. Well, that depends upon viewers. I think they can help us to repeat that. Our business is just to give the information. Let's remember, so the last 24 hours, same fight in the same directions. We got hit by another cruise missile in Odessa. 15-year-old guy died there. They hit an uh, apartment building. We destroyed a uh, four-post, the UAV over Odessa. We also have sunken two boats today from Bayraktar. We saw that, yeah, on the video. So Russians, they built a little base on uh, the Snake Island, that infamous one. So we're hitting them, we hit them twice before and we hit them the third time today. And it's really nowhere to hide on that small island. Before that we hit one, didn't sink it, today we sunk two. They're small boats, support boats. Chernobyevka, I think it was 17th time today. Um, yeah, we saw your post. I need still fail to understand why are they doing it. You've told us many times, but uh, we still fail to get it. It's a mystery even for me. I would understand if they were gathering troops there before they move it further. But they're also bringing munitions there regularly. They store them there, in the same place, in the very same place, almost. It's a big square, they're trying to move things around, but it usually gets them. There are actually more hits, there are three or four good hits today, but we do not count the smaller ones, we only count the ones where it goes boom for several hours after, or goes up in one big explosion, that what happened today. There are more events besides today, but uh, they're more of a poli political color. We'll talk about them, okay. Any news about Gerasimov, if you really visit it? No, there is no confirmation. I've seen some British and American sources claiming that today, but I'm not in a hurry to confirm it. So, let's go place by place. Kherson, are they still preparing to referendum or they've taken a pause? It doesn't appear that they're really going to do a full-scale referendum. They probably will just announce that this region joined Russia. And referendum, I don't believe anyone will believe that. You know, they still need to do something for some formality. They can tell yesterday there was a referendum. They made two attempts. They made one right after they captured it and another one recently. Didn't quite work. They brought some people to the city to show that locals support them. There were actually locals who were protesting, so it didn't work. And now with uh, our troops 20 miles, not even 20 miles away from the city, this will not fly at all. So now, if they announce that they joined Kherson to Russia with the Amer uh, with United uh, with the Ukraine army around it. Um, 
What have they joined? Well, I can ask you the following question. What happens? What have they joined when we actually surround, surround them and capture their troops and cut their armies apart on the field? And have you heard today another statement from Ukraine? They will not be a peace treaty with Russia. So, did he probably got a permission from president to say that? Yeah, he's not a bureaucrat who does anything on his own. So, of course. So, negotiations are out, pretty much. And uh, also an article by Yermak to the world audience about the international politics. I think uh, he was good in terms. He is basically with this happening a second 30 year old war. Uh, there was one that led to Westfall uh, agreement back in the 1800s and this one might lead to the big tectonic changes in the world power structure. Remember when we looked at the speech of Truss, the Minister of Britain, that there may be powers interested in changing things. In the last 20 years, we were actually letting one of such powers to the East do that that Russia was hiding their ideology under real politic term and the West was hiding their ideology behind real politic. I think that's a very smart formula for what was happening. The old system is indeed being broken as we speak. Uh, archaic moves are winning over in Russia. I remember my discourse back in 1945. This is basically a civilizational war in that sense. So it might continue till 2042. The only thing is how it will be happening. And it, then it could be a 30-year-old war from that point of view. And what's important that Ukraine is offering actual active ways to address that. And that new Active 24 is the new system that would help other countries to get protection and to create a new system that would allow for humanitarian, political, and military support throughout the world, those people who would want to join that system. So we suggest that we offered that new system uh, in time, in, in place of the old one that was destroyed consciously by the participants of that system and by forces in Russia. And our new offer, what we do offer to the world, is freedom. That's our input to the international division of labor. It's probably the freest economic option. So, in a way, it's kind of reminiscent of Zaporozhsk back in the day when they would accept you to live there if you just agree to the values of that area. So our offer is the free structure with countries that allow people to realize their potential. And this is not just my opinion, this basically now is a statement of the leaders of our country in times when we're going through the biggest turmoil and fighting a deadly adversary. And that's an interesting change because the last 30 years time frame, nobody really offered that new vision of the world. And these people pulling backwards were trying to sell us some historic things. Uh, globalists were trying to sell us some generic views. Uh, 
Zygmunt Freud said, said back in the day that a human is a person who is determined by future more than by his past. And even regardless of his diver excursion back in the past and how it affects the future, he was the one to acknowledge that future can actually change everything. And me, personally, as someone who has devoted a lot of time to psychology, I can confirm that a person can postulate his future and basically determine his future by that statement. That can negate a lot of things that happened to him in the past and define and form his future. A lot of things will drag him down, but they only drag until the person made his worldview for the future, his position for the future, his picture of a future. One of the mistakes of uh, the Kremlin regime was that they made a bet on the past. One of the grave mistakes of Ukraine was also that we're looking and we're kind of stuck in the past. So this is the first time when our leaders suggest a new view, a new vision of the future. Because right now, looking at this disaster here, we need a new system of security. Everybody understands that NATO didn't quite work out as advertised, the United Nations failed as well. So, there is a need for a new system. Oh, sorry. And now the leadership of the country that is struggling for these humanitarian values fighting a deadly enemy, uh, suggesting to shoot for these values. So now we do have, uh, so to say, an icing on the cake that we're actually fighting for that new vision of the world, freer and more rewarding with more opportunities to the participants. And we invite everybody who wants to join. It's not for the simple word. It's an actual offer, and uh, there are actual concrete steps that we outline there. There are not too many details drafted yet. Uh, it's just a column and a publication, but I'm sure they'll be adding more notes. So the World Labor Division is an interesting view it didn't quite work in the First World War because people believed that that division of labor will not allow the countries to fight. And it didn't quite work out. People still fought wars. It's more of a figure of speech because we and no one can really state that wars are to be no more. Humanity will likely have wars for a long time. But there is a difference between a civilized war, probably economic in other ways, and the war that's that happened in Bucha. Big difference. Civilized rules of engagement were actually designed about 300 years ago, but the problem is not many countries are following them. So now we have a good application with a good uh, hint of metaphysical approach in it as well and philosophical approach. And that's a new reading of the word freedom as well. It's the Ukrainian word for freedom, which is also uh, the same word as will, the will of a spirit, the power to do things. So, freedom and power and will is our commitment to that table. This is the core position of our President Zelensky. And before it sounded more like a weird anecdote because people were more concerned with corruption, with uh, which congressman got in a car accident and what happened. But now we actually, while we are in a deadly fight with a serious foe, that usually brings up the best out of people in this situation. So look at our president. He is talking to the world leaders as one of their equals. And actually, yeah, he's actually leading it, uh, the conversation about freedoms. 
And to consider the bigger picture, if anything happens with Russia and it withdraws from the world political arena for a while, um, Kiev will have to be a decision or an atmosphere maker for the countries around it, like Moldova and Belarus and others. So, yeah, here that's important that our freedom is not just freedom, it's also a power, a willpower to do things. Personally, it's interesting for me to also observe that our office of the president had finally moved from solving daily tactical things to addressing the big global picture, almost on a metaphysical level. You know, like how Putin, his meta history, was he pushing in Russia? Um, we are doing a different side of that, different flavor of that here. And uh, another thing, you know, right now observe that there are some people who are sharing free, uh, sharing the victory. So, you know, I told that we once won back in the day when we started quarreling. Now we're also definitely won when people are trying to take credit for that victory. There's a difference, though. Some of them are writing long, blo like lengthy blogs about victory. And the difference between them and uh, Mark and myself and people with us of the same opinion is that there are stars and then there are professionals. Professionals usually trying to hit the trends to match the current mood and try. They have templates, they have certain procedures and all. And personally, I don't think I ever used a template. I've never tried to hit the trend or match the trend. I would just take the phone and uh, say what I wanted to say, what was pour, pouring out of from my soul. So just like now I'm talking to you, that's how I think. Sometimes I make mistakes, I change my opinions. And, you know, when your opinion is not really matching the environment, you seem freakish, but when you do catch that resonate, resonance, you ride that wave. And whenever that resonance factor appears, all the clay figures, the people who are pretending to be, they actually fall apart, but the real ones, they stay. So right now we have such a number of patriotic texts, texts I'm not even uh, pointing at certain figures and well-known bloggers who are also getting their attention and likes. But if you read through them, there is a big emptiness behind them because they're just trying to hit the trend. And the last thing you should be doing is trying to hit it. Like Stanislavski used to say, act, the worst thing an actor can do is try to be liked. So as people, different uh, sides in Ukraine started to claim their stakes in victory, the office of president came out with that brilliant publication. And you can compare the text of Truss from Britain and text of Yermak from Ukraine. And it will be a good question to ask who's uh, more brilliant. It's a nice feeling to be riding that wave. 360-something thousand decided to watch that philosophic detour today. I have another piece of news, Mark, today. Today we got a soldier who surrendered with a leaflet, Legion Free Russia. He actually came with that leaflet, found our soldiers and gave up, surrendered. And he said he wanted, he came because he wants to join that Legion. I actually posted that and I said, hey, look, Aristovich sent that. Thing is, I got that from Russia. Um, another thing in Omsk, I think it was Omsk, right across from the city administration, somebody painted on the wall facing the administration, Legion Free Russia, and in Moscow, similar paintings appeared, murals on the walls, and also on one of the police capture vehicles, one guy threw a Molotov cocktail and made a bit of a firebomb out of that vehicle. And by the way, I'm not sure if he got caught, but he did say, he did shout, Legion Free Russia. 
So it's curious to see what's happening. Before we talk about Lavrov and his anti-Semitism, um, Kleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, turned to Beijing asking for them to be the guarantor of Ukrainian freedom in a possible accord. How would you judge such a situation when the West is still trying to figure what to do with Beijing with uh, those uh, artificial islands um, and at the same time trying to engage them with the Ukraine problem. Uh, Beijing has complex relations with the West. I'm not an economist, but uh, I think it's about 75% that uh, China is exporting to the West, while the United States, although they do not manufacture everything, they do produce about 80% for their, for their own market. So even if they drift apart, U.S. will take a hit of 20%, China may take a hit of 75%. Also, if you look at the real territory of China, they, while they're one of the most populated countries in the world, actually most of them live on in the south, on the stripe, along the coast. And they have a lot of land in the middle that is still undeveloped, and then there are more lands in the north. I've been there. Yeah, there are steps there. There is really not much. They have a lot of internal pressure that they need to manage, and if they fail to manage socio-economic flows properly, that uh, lid may blow internally. And regardless of how many aircraft carriers and other military things they build, the smallest problem with the West, China is immediately starting to drift to face huge economic problems internally. And still an interesting thing about China, with all these problems, they're spending a lot of money for the artificial intelligence, about 600 billion. They're still trying to explore space. They're building space station of their own. There are issues, but they're still trying. So even with all these troubles, they're trying to prom to advance the civilization. Yes, but they're Marxist and uh, Confucianist uh, philosophies and stuff, but they're still making an effort to push civilizational development. At the same time, to compare, Putin's regime is uh, anti-civilizational. It's kind of a... Their offer is a picture of Stalin and maybe one of their last czars sprinkled with blood. Yeah, if you, even if you look at their new church, military church they built, that even smells of some Satanism. It's, it's kind of a cult. They, I heard they're even keeping some weird uh, artifacts in that one. Oh, interesting, interesting news. I did not know that. So, Chinese are saying we are ready to compete and ready to fight for our interests, but definitely not at the price of destruction of civilization. And what do we hear from those uh, half-wits, dimwits in Moscow? We have the red button, everybody will turn in nuclear dust. How should China treat them? I don't think that threats from that uh, bolding uh, leader of Russia are something that they appreciate. So I do think it's possible for China to cooperate with the West, but we'll see how that comes through, if it comes through. Also, I need, want to mention, it's the last day of Ramadan, and uh, we congratulate all the Muslims. It's a big holiday. All the Muslims of the world, this is about 1.5 billion people. It's an old and uh, beautiful religion that many people follow. And the world, we need to understand the world does owe some to, actually a lot to the Muslim culture, to the scientists. And in Ukraine, Muslim culture is actually a big part of our culture. Right now, there is an, an actual detachment of Crimean Tatars fighting for Ukraine. Um, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, our lady is from um, Crimea, she's an ethnic Tatar. We have a lot of uh, prominent leaders and cultural and political figures in Ukraine.
We can't, yeah, we, there is no way we name all of them, Mustafa Aga and others. So for us, all that is important. I have a lot of friends personally among Muslims. Our country has a lot of friends in the king's dynasty down south in the Gulf. And we value their input to the world culture and world civilization and congratulate them all with that wonderful holiday. And now we can go to Lavrov's statement today that apparently Hitler is one of the Jews. Actually, circumcised one, right? Lavrov probably done it himself. You know an old saying, whatever fool does, he is doing it wrong. I just want to finish that. Me, personally, as a Jew, my mother is Russian. Um, I did, though, make a statement in Ukrainian SME, uh, media already that in '94 I did vote to acknowledge Armenian genocide because it was important at the day to actually acknowledge it. And Lavrov, a Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, is an Armenian ethnic Armenian. His uh, actual last name is Kalantarov. And uh, what he said today is equal if I stated that uh, Turkish king back in the day was uh, Armenian, in fact, and he ordered to commit genocide against other Armenians. But that's what pretty much what he said about Hitler today. Well, he said Hitler had had uh, Jewish roots. Yeah, he did not add too much details, but that's a known and disproved fake. But why do you connect? Jews and Nazis in one statement. I think there are two things here. He kind of was tired and just spilled it out, or maybe it was a purposeful statement. I believe that chosen is probably a more a selected statement, is a more proper description of that. Because one thing, it, it might be a mix though, he could be, it could be part of his personal belief and then he kind of knowingly allowed it to slip. In 1982, I'm saying some things not many people know, when Israel attacked uh, Libya, uh, KGB of USSR got a task to push anti-Semitism as much as they can. So they were looking for options to name every dissident a Jew. In KGB, they had a big wave of anti-Semitism because that was one of the uh, trends at the moment and people were adapting to it. Another thing that's happening here with Lavrov's speech that he's kind of trying to match the deeper undertones in the family. So one of the instructions in KGB so, one of the important things for KGB agents that was mentioned back in the day to get in the circles of people who oppose the Soviet regime was to be anti-Semitic. So, it is part of their culture. It is still somewhat used um, and it does resonate apparently with some deeper flows in the country's psychology. So the thing is that Lavrov, who was avoiding the sanctions for longest time, that till the 2020, he have never stepped into Crimea to not be sanctioned. He tried to retire several times and even bought a small chain of supermarket, uh, supermarket chain in the United States. He also, I think, has one daughter in Israel. So, and then he makes that statement. So he either drank that Kool-Aid to the degree that he decided to push it, or he was tasked to stay that, to say that. I'm thinking he was broken. He was pushed to say that. He did not have anything to play against it, and he was pushed to make such a statement. And it is linked to the fact that they probably 
in my opinion, that, that they are getting their own uh, declassified elements to go and fight in Ukraine. So they're basically addressing the deeper psychological issues in the Russian society that you're fighting with both fascists and Jews. And this, yeah, this is kind of like a unique combo. You're fighting both, right? Both archetypes, archetypical enemies that some people believe are the enemies. And and that's what I think the statement is about. This is the internal oriented task. This is the work on the inner market. And they're trying to be liked or be reciprocated by their inner audience in Russia. Of course, there would be a scandal. He picked the right place. Well, he picked any place who would ask him, because not many people are talking to him now. If it was a French or Chinese media, he would probably stated it there. He's addressing it to the internal audience, so he doesn't really matter where would he had spilled it. Now we do know, though, that those who play the anti-Semitic card in the USSR usually end up badly. This is usually... Yeah, those people who try to solve that, to use these cards, usually end up badly. So, in my opinion, the fact that they're using it uh, means that they're on their last path. What was it, the movie, if to rephrase it, do not threaten Jews when you're sitting and drinking juice in synagogue, or in Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. This is hard to imagine a worse step, because you're, as representative of the country, already also suffered from genocide. You're basically taking another nation who lost almost six million people in the other war due to the same geno similar genocide and who are repressed in Russia as well in the Soviet Union you know the doctor's case and many other things that Jewish autonomous Republic in the middle of nowhere in the very east where they were exiled and you're using that to provoke new murders of Ukrainians if this is not a degradation of um, character, I don't know what it is, because the reaction of the world will be immediate. I saw what's happening in Israel. I checked their statements of their first uh, political persons. Do you think it will lead to anything? I don't know if it will lead to anything, but the reaction itself is uh, potent. Again, Israel is somewhat a murky country. They're dependent upon Russia to a great extent, there are many people from Russia originally in Israel, and Israel needs to take care of their own security. They're a small country surrounded by many other countries with whom Russia has uh, sometimes friendly relations. There are more things I can talk about, about the leaders of some of these countries and Israel leaders who are being take, received in Moscow and how they received. So. But using such a rhetoric that basically puts a really bad light on any relations possible between Russia and Israel, until the proper apologies are issued, because bringing up something as dirty and as uh, debunked as Hitler having Jewish roots. This is also the denial, the Holocaust denial, basically, what they're saying. I'm actually thinking, is he, is there Dugin's trace in that statement? Because he's their irreplaceable ideologist in Kremlin. Yeah, he's... Uh, I actually know Dugin. I was a friend with uh, Gedar Jamal, who fought in Niger 
Uh, but Dugin, and who is a good friend with Dugin, but Dugin is a philosopher, he's not a practicist. So, these politicians, though, Lavrov and his folks, they're, they're actually real politicians, so they're using, they could use that. Dugin is just philosophizing. Well, the thing is, he did manage to promote his dictionary of these views onto them. And the story is about that. That's a, just a little bit that you could get a glimpse of the internal view, internal world of Kremlin and Putin's gang. How deteriorated are those views inside? You've just were given a little peek at that. And through their through their own projection, they're accusing us of the same. So imagine what's in there. What's their full scale? So, conscious citizens in Russia, I would be horrified if I saw that, and, you know, I'd probably join the Legion Free Russia if I could at this point, because what are you to lose? Are you going to endure that regime with these views? I don't even know what to, how to name it, because uh, Satanism is a too weak of a term for them. It is uh, basically some kind of black degradation. And now it's a government policy in Russia, stated by the Minister of Foreign Affairs on the world scene in the Italian SME, in the Italian media. You'll be laughing, but we made a new record right now. 504,000 people watching us live. I wonder if that your speech about new vision of the world coming from Ukraine is a culprit. I remind our viewers we're live for 36 minutes. All 500 and few thousand of you, please do also subscribe to Fagin Live channel, to Alexei's channel. We already are at 1.2 million subscribers, and uh, if you are watching that in English, please subscribe to the Privateer Station and to leave a like as well. Regarding microphone, do not blame the sound on him, because he is always casting from unknown locations. Sometimes he has a good one, sometimes he has a weird one. I got this one. This one is actually good, but it does depend upon the quality of the internet connection greatly. So, apologies if something was breaking. So, tomorrow, if you're not against, we'll return to that subject. Mark, ask me tomorrow about the intercepts. I got a few new intercepts. They're really curious. Very curious information. Yep, let's Let's talk about it tomorrow. I just want people to digest what we talked about today, maybe looked up the publications we talked about. So come tomorrow, do not miss any day, and we'll also announce one NFT project tomorrow to support Azov Battalion that are defending Mariupol. 